When I was a kid growing up in England, I used to pretend to be a badger. <laughs> My sister and I would walk out our back door, head down the lane, climb over an old rusty gate to end up standing underneath a grand old hollow tree. Inside of this tree, we became badgers. We'd crawl in through the entrance, slithering through the soft sand, not caring how many spider webs got on our extra curly hair. This is how I learned to love nature. Then, when I was 14 years old, I moved from the British countryside to Southern California's Inland Empire. <laughs> I didn't so much as feel culture shock, but I did experience nature shock. My new environment totally disoriented me. I was used to living in my old brick farmhouse, where sheep were literally my only neighbors, and I had views of hillsides like this. Now I was living in a stucco home, surrounded by a sea of tracked houses, and I had views of hillsides like this. <laughs> I thought that because they were brown and dry, that they were dead spaces. I thought that the only places where things could grow were in people's well-watered front yards. I didn't realize how wrong I could be. But it wasn't until I got to college that I really started to understand the new environment I was living in. For four years at UC Riverside, I studied entomology, the wonderful and sometimes weird lives of insects. <laughs> This hillside did not look dead to me anymore. I began to see it as a home for the hundreds and thousands of insect species that lived there. It was their habitat. Fast forward to 2008, and I've just landed my dream job at a natural history museum in Los Angeles, and I was going to get paid to geek out with scientists <laughs> about snails and slugs, reptiles and amphibians, insects, and all manner of life on Earth. I could not believe my luck. But some of my friends and family were baffled because it meant I was going to be moving here, <laughs> Los Angeles. Someone even said to me, but Leela, why would you move to LA? You love nature. <laughs> From the very beginning, I knew they were wrong, and so I was hell-bent on proving to them that there's so much nature here in this city, and I want to share with you a few of the things I found over the last nine years. I found wild purple mushrooms growing up in Griffith Park, the cutest baby octopus in a tide pool in San Pedro. I know. <laughs> Glowing scorpions at my favorite campground in the San Gabriel Mountains. But what about down here in the heart of the city, where it's much more concrete and a snarl of freeways? Well, I've also found tiny little potter wasp nests growing on weeds in the Compton Creek. <laughs> I found orb weaver spiders grow on a men's restroom in Long Beach. <laughs> Don't ask me what I was doing at that men's restroom looking for spiders, but it's part of my job. <laughs> Not to mention the hundreds of species of insects in the nature garden at my museum, the gardens that I helped to design and build, which are only six miles from downtown LA. As I'd hoped, no matter where I was in Los Angeles, I could find nature. It was simply as easy as slowing down and looking, or what I call putting my nature eyes on. I urge you all to put your nature eyes on over the next couple days. Pay attention as you walk out your front door. Look up as you go to the bank. Look down as you go to the grocery store, because what you see might surprise you. And I believe that the nature here in Los Angeles isn't just surprising and sometimes a little weird and what I believe is beautiful but also it is valuable. Urban nature is worthy of our study, it is worthy of our love, and it's worthy of our care. This is Dr. Brian Brown. He's one of the scientists at my museum, and he also happens to be one of the world's leading fly researchers. <laughs> yeah, Brian studies flies for a living, which means that sometimes he sits at his microscope and looks at fly genitals for hours on end. <laughs> Because seriously, this is how some fly species are identified, by looking at their genitals under microscopes. One thing that most people don't know about Brian is he's a bit of a betting man. And 
One night at a dinner with a museum donor, Brian boasted, I can just as easily find a new fly here in LA as I could in Costa Rica or Brazil. The donor reached across the table, shook his hand and said, you're on. A few days later, Brian went to the Brentwood backyard and set up an insect trap. He left it up for a week and then went back to get the collecting jar, now full of insects. He took it back to his lab in the museum and sat down next to his microscope and started to sort through those insects. First, he pulled out all the flies and put everything else to the side. And then he took out just the humpback flies. This is the group of flies that Brian's a world expert on, also known as forids. One fly stood out in particular, and so he took it out, put it under his microscope, and took it through his scientific key to see if it would match with anything. It didn't. It was a brand new species to science. No scientist had ever seen this fly before. It's that big one with the head popped off. <laughs> there were two other flies in this sample that were very interesting. Neither of them had been found here in North America before. One had only been known to exist in Europe, and the, only had known, the other one only known to exist in Africa. So let's recap. In just one week's worth of sampling, looking at just one Brentwood backyard, and only looking at the forward flies, humpback flies, Brian made three big scientific discoveries. Based on this success, Brian decided he, what would happen if I could expand this survey and take it all across the whole city? What if I could put traps in everyone's backyard? Okay, not literally everyone's, but that's exactly what's happened over the last five years. We partnered with 61 families and one middle school, and these families have cared and hosted the traps in their backyards. This is what we call citizen science. It's the general public working with researchers to answer real world questions. And Brian's real world question, how many species of flies could he find that were new? 43. And counting. So 43 new species of fly living here in Los Angeles. This all goes to show that when we look in our cities, there are discoveries to be made and there are new species to be found. How many new species might be living in your backyard? <laughs> or what about your schoolyard? This is Leo Politi Elementary School. It sits just two miles from downtown LA as the crow flies. It's in one of the densest parts of the city, and there's about 25,000 people per square mile. That means there's not that much room for nature to grow or for kids to play. Knowing this, Principal Brad Rumble wanted to build a garden. He wanted a space for the 817 students at his school to get up close and personal with nature. So in 2009, he took this empty part of the campus and he built a garden working with the students. I heard about the transformation and wanted to pay a visit. So I went and the garden was beautiful. It was buzzing with life birds flying overhead, hummingbirds, moths, ladybugs, all manner of life. But even more, than, even more beautiful than the nature, it was the students and how they were acting that was beautiful to me. One little boy came up to me and told me about the black Phoebe he'd seen sitting on the fence earlier that day. A little girl came up and told me about the seven-spotted ladybug she'd seen eating aphids the day before. Someone must have keyed her in and told her how much I love aphids. <laughs> and it wasn't just me noticing the effects on the students, it was Brad noticing the effects too. Student disciplinary actions had gone down to almost zero since the garden went in, and science test scores had skyrocketed. To put it in Brad's words, they had gone from the basement to the penthouse in science. To put it in facts and figures, before the garden was put in, 9% of the students tested proficient on the science test. After the garden was put in, 54%. This transformation was so stunning that I wanted to share the story as far and wide as I could. And so a few months later, I went back to the school to try and do just that. I was given an empty classroom, and 16 third and fourth graders filed in. 
They sat down, and I gave each one of them a piece of paper and a pencil. And then I had them close their eyes. And I asked them to go back to their garden in their mind, to remember all the things they'd done there, all the plants and animals they'd seen, all the lessons they'd had. And then I had them draw their very first nature memory map. This was my favorite map from that day. It was by Marlon, who was 11 at the time, and I love the way you can imagine how excited the kids were that day the hummingbird got stuck in their classroom, <laughs> or how contemplative Marlon must have been when he saw the spider spinning her little web. I also love how he puts nature into context. He doesn't just put the nature in the garden, he puts in the teacher's parking lot and the food for less where he and his family grocery <laughs> shops. Because nature exists in his entire community. We took every single one of those 17 maps from that day and turned it into one composite map. We had a professional illustrator make it, and now this is that map. And it lives in our exhibit about LA nature at the museum. And on opening day, we invited Marlon and Mr. Rumble and the rest of the students to be our honored guests. We wanted to make sure that they knew how important their stories of nature and that their garden was. So I love talking about kids connecting with nature, but what about adults, right? How do adults connect with nature in our city? For many, nature is a place where we have peace and quiet. It's a place to go to to meditate, relax, and de-stress. Because let's face it, our cities can be stressful places. Have any of you ever been stressed out here in LA? <laughs> Yeah, me too. When I'm stressed out, I head to the mountains to breathe in a more pristine wilderness. But more often than not, it's the nature right outside my front door that I can get to. It's fast, it's easy, it's free, and I can do it every day. I do what I call a nature mindfulness meditation. And I live in one of the most dense parts of the city in Koreatown, so most people don't expect there to be nature there. But you've guessed it. They're wrong. And this is some of the nature I've found over the last few years of doing this walk. For one block, I just breathe and notice how my body feels. Then as I cross over the street, I begin to focus on everything that I'm seeing, and then a block where I focus on just the things that I'm hearing, and then a block on everything that I'm smelling. On my final block, I let everything wash over me, not holding on to any of my thoughts, worries, fears, hopes, or dreams. <sighs> I do this walk a lot. I did this walk just the other day because surprisingly, practicing for this talk, a little bit stressful. And to my knowledge, no one has ever studied the effects of an urban nature walk like this. But I wonder if they did, would it show some of the same health benefits as forest bathing? For those of you that don't know, forest bathing is a practice in Japan where people go take a short visit to nature to literally breathe it in. Researchers have found over the last few years that among other things, forest bathing serves to decrease stress hormones, lower blood pressure, and lower your pulse rate. It also helps to increase concentration. And although no one studied my health benefits, I can feel the effects when I'm done. I feel calmer, I feel happier, I feel less stressed out. Nature is helping me, and that in turn makes me love nature all the much more. I would hope that everyone could learn to love nature in the city as much as I do, which I know is a little bit super idealistic and Pollyanna-ish, but it's still the dream that I have. I came up with an idea to maybe get towards that dream in a bit of a unique and maybe odd way. In 2011, I thought, maybe we could make noticing and finding nature into a competition, a competition between two cities, LA and San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, so working... <laughs> Working with my good friend, Allison Young, who works at a San Francisco Natural History Museum, we created a City Nature Challenge. We capitalized on the long-standing rivalry between our two cities, and we put the word out on social media. We got our parents involved, my mom got out there, 
And we even got LA's mayor, Eric Garcetti, to be involved. He found a snail. Go, Eric Garcetti. <laughs> And it was a huge success. In just one week, we got 20,000 wildlife observations from thousands of San Franciscans and Los Angelinos. They all became citizen scientists and sent in their pictures of wildlife. And guess what? LA won. <laughs> success of this challenge spread and this year, other cities wanted to participate. We had 16 cities across the United States take part. From New York to Miami, from Dallas to Chicago, people got out there and found nature in their backyards. Not to mention, they all wanted to try and beat LA. <laughs> we got 125,000 observations in just five days. Everything from the common pigeon, which was seen in every single city. <laughs> Surprise! to orcas right off the coast of Seattle, to a critically endangered butterfly which was found in Florida. And this time, LA did not win. That honor went to Dallas, Texas, and as they say, do not mess with Texas. <laughs> Next year, we're going global. Alice and I are already in planning mode, and we have over 100 cities get gearing up to participate, and I'm really excited to see the results. Scientifically, I hope we get a lot of good data, a snapshot that shows the world how much nature lives in our cities. But more than that, it's the stories that I'm excited to hear. The stories of kids here in LA finding nature, the stories of kids in Mumbai finding nature just like my sister and I did when we were kids in England. Stories that show that all over the world, people are loving and caring for nature in their cities. I hope that you all, when you leave today, think about how you're going to love nature in your city just a little bit more. Are you going to go out there and put your nature eyes on and breathe it in? Will you go out and become a citizen scientist and take pictures or put an insect trap in your backyard so scientists can understand how nature in our cities works? Or will you go that one step further and grow a garden and love and care for it like the kids at Leo Politi? It's up to you how you decide to love nature in your city. I'm excited to hear the stories, though, particularly of all you Angelinos, because if we can do it here in Los Angeles, imagine what it would be like when we're doing it all over the world, everyone loving nature in their cities just a little bit more. Thank you. <laughs>